Well, thank you. Good to be back in Pittsburgh and uh, provide a little context about some of the big things happening at unexpected and accelerating speed in the national and world energy scene. Let me start with <clears throat> a business book we put out a few years ago, 61 of us in six quarters, constructed a kind of grand synthesis of U.S. energy potential called Reinventing Fire. Uh, <clears throat> and it shows rigorously how to run a 2.6-fold bigger U.S. economy in 2050 using no oil, no coal, no nuclear energy, a third less natural gas, uh, tripled efficiency, quintupled renewables, emitting 85 percent or so less carbon, and <clears throat> costing $5 trillion less than business as usual in net present value, assuming that all hidden or external costs, including carbon emissions, are worth zero, a, a conservatively low estimate. Uh, we found this could be done with no new inventions and no act of Congress, because the policy changes needed could be done at a city or state level or a federal administrative level, uh, <clears throat> but rather the transition could be led by business for profit, and the $5 trillion on the table is an ample inducement. The U.S. is actually on this trajectory so far, only we're a bit ahead in renewables, uh, but, uh, for example, our use of electricity and gasoline have both been falling since 2007, and we can further accelerate those falls at historically reasonable rates uh, by having some smart policies in mindful markets, but most of all through uh, four kinds of innovation not just the usual two, technology and public policy, but also design, uh, the way technology is combined, and also new business models, new competitive strategies, new financing methods. There's huge innovation in all of those areas, and they give much more than the sum of the parts. Uh, so we could actually follow the reputed advice of General Eisenhower that if a problem is too big to solve, enlarge it. Don't chop it up into little bite-sized pieces, but move the boundaries out until they encompass the, what the solution requires, more options, more synergies, more degrees of freedom. Uh, as a small example, uh, <clears throat> automakers are starting to make electric cars out of stuff like this. This is my little carbon cap. Uh, but it's, it's just a test piece for military helmets that have been shipping for some years using a production process one of our spin-offs developed that we sold now into the supply chain. It's with a German Tier 1. Uh, let's see. Can you, I don't know if you can hear it ring, but it rings like a bell because it's uh, uh, extremely uh, stiff and strong. And now this process can make two by two meter complex uh, carbon fiber structural parts for autos in one minute just as this was made in one minute eight years ago. Well, if, you, if we made all our cars that way, we'd save a lot of lives because this stuff absorbs six to 12 times the crash energy of steel per pound and does so more smoothly. But also, we would save oil equivalent uh, to half an OPEC or one and a half Saudis at a cost of 18 bucks a barrel. That just pays for the electrification because the ultralighting turns out to be approximately free. It's paid for by much simpler manufacturing with 80 percent less capital and by needing three times fewer of the costly batteries or fuel cells. But once <clears throat> you have electric cars uh, becoming affordable much sooner because you need so few batteries, uh, BMW indeed says the carbon fiber in the I3 is paid for by needing fewer batteries. Uh, then you have a lot of distributed storage in the grid that can more gracefully integrate varying solar and wind power. So it turns out to be easier to solve the car and electricity problems together than separately. And we find those kinds of synergies throughout the energy system when we carefully integrate all four sectors that use energy, namely transport, buildings, industry, and electricity. And our team works in, in equal depth in all of those. Now, the uh, 
This is not just a, a U.S. potential. Uh, we will release in two months work with uh, the China Energy Group at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and the top energy policy and analytic shops in Beijing attached to the National Development and Reform Commission because the, the paramount leaders of China have called for a revolution, not a word, word they use lightly, in the consumption and production of energy. They need it because they're running the world's second biggest economy on basically 1920s Pittsburgh uh, fuel and technology, uh, except the technology is moving fast, the fuel more slowly, so you can't breathe the air. That really gets their attention. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> our, our group, 80 of us for two years now, in mostly Beijing and Berkeley, has been working out the roadmap for that revolution. Our customers are the authors of the energy content of the 13th five-year plan, and they're very keen to apply what we've come up with, which is even better than for the U.S., namely by 2050 in China, six-fold higher energy productivity, 11-fold higher carbon productivity, uh, so the peak carbon occurs even earlier than promised and several trillion dollars cheaper than business as usual. Uh, the reason China can do a bit better than we can uh, is that they're a bit less efficient to start with, but also they're building so much infrastructure and can more easily build it right than fix it later. Uh, <clears throat> You've heard a lot, I expect, about the global revolution in renewable energy, and it's self-reinforcing because the cheaper it gets, the more we buy, so the cheaper it gets, so the more we buy. And it scales in a fundamentally different way than the old energy sources. Uh, if, you, um, if you build a cathedral-like power plant, it takes many years to design, license, and build. But meanwhile, with about the same capital, you could build a whole string of photovoltaic plants, each of which uh, produces annually enough solar cells to produce annually as much electricity as your cathedral was going to produce once it's built. And if you put realistic numbers on that, even after the first 10 years, you got 15 times as much solar as cathedral produced electricity, and then the solar just runs away. So uh, that's why solar is scaling faster than cell phones worldwide. Uh, wind is also scaling very fast. Wind and solar and a few minor non-hydro renewables together, each of the past four years have added over 80 gigawatts. They add more than all the fossil nuclear plants add in capacity, uh, not counting their bigger retirements. Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which tracks all these transactions, thinks that in the next 15 years, the additions of fossil nuclear plants worldwide, again, not counting bigger retirements, will be cut by half because they can't compete anymore, they have no business case, while the additions of renewables will at least triple. And indeed, those modern renewables each of the past four years have gotten over a quarter trillion dollars a year in private investment, which is a good deal more than the total market cap of the coal industry. Uh, so things are changing very fast and, it, and accelerating rapidly. Uh, for example, Tony Seba, the Stanford Innovation Lecturer, came up with a couple of lovely photos uh, from the uh, National Archive looking down Fifth Avenue in the Easter Parade in Manhattan. Uh, in 1900, you have to look hard to see the first car. In 1913, you have to look even harder to find the last horse which illustrates how the pace of transformation when things get going like this is set not by incumbents but by insurgents. They are not inhibited by the incumbents' physical or psychological assets, uh, not encumbered by their business models or cultures. They don't need all the same infrastructure. Uh, and indeed, investors flee before customers do. Uh, as soon as the capital markets sent, uh, uh, sent the uh, whiff of disruption, they don't wait for the old industries to be in the toaster or heading for the toaster or for the toast to get done. They're out of there. They invest in the new stuff. And indeed, the electricity and uh, oil industries as we have known them are now being decapitalized uh, because there are better buys. That's why Solar City pays two or 300 basis points less for capital 
uh, than the average utility does. It's less risky. It's the yield co. And indeed, when we put out a report last year called the Economics of Grid Defection on how the ability to switch to a combination of ever cheaper photovoltaics and ever cheaper batteries was going to sweep across the country well within the lives of existing utility assets, Barclays downgraded the whole utility sector because the old business models would have no place to hide and they're not ready for that kind of competition. So that's why we've pulled together a bunch of incumbents and insurgents to figure out together in a safe place uh, what the next electricity looks like, industry looks like, and how to create mutual value rather than just lobbing grenades in public. That's called eLab, uh, Electricity Innovation Lab, and it's all open source at rmi.org. The numbers are really compelling. New uh, <coughs> wind and photovoltaic power in levelized cost typically beat anything on the supply side, including new gas plants. And they have a stable price, not a volatile price. Uh, efficiency is even cheaper. Uh, and to go back to reinventing fire, the internal rates of return we found, just to illustrate, were 33% for tripling or quadrupling the efficiency of buildings, new and old, 21% uh, for doubling the energy productivity of industry, 17% for getting U.S. mobility completely off oil. That's about 25 bucks a barrel. So if your oil business uh, feels pain at $90 and swoons at 50, how will it do at 25? That's what it has to compete with, and that's falling. Uh, and the, the IRR for all of the above plus an 80% renewable half-distributed highly resilient electric system is 14%. I'm not counting, of course, enormous externalities, positive and avoided negative, that would make the returns just astronomical. But I want to end with a few remarks on how quickly things are changing on the demand side, because the big game changer we found in reinventing fire is what's called integrative design. We, this has been cooking in our little black swan hatchery for a few decades. We have now demonstrated it in over 1,000 buildings and $40 billion worth of new and old factories and a bunch of vehicles. And what it enables you to do is design a building or factory or piece of equipment or vehicle as a whole system for multiple benefits rather than isolated components for single benefits and thereby get much bigger energy savings at typically lower capital cost than smaller no savings. So you get expanding returns, not diminishing returns. As a small example, I live in a fairly severe climate. It used to go to minus 47F on occasion. 7,100 feet up in the Rockies near Aspen, but I'm a passive solar banana farmer. In the middle of our house, we've just uh, ripened 58 banana crops, and we don't do combustion. That's so 20th century. We don't have a heating system, and the capital cost of not putting in a heating system uh, <coughs> was bigger than the stuff we did pay for to get rid of it, so the construction cost went down. And this was an archetype for uh, 30,000 odd passive buildings in Europe. Indeed, in Dutch social housing now, uh, there is now a nice uh, effort, which is about a year, I think, from really making this work. They've cut the cost in half in a year now, uh, to retrofit to net zero energy standard and pay for, uh, pay for the financing entirely out of saved energy. Or to give you another example of how fast things are moving, um, when I led the design for the retrofit of the Empire State Building in 2010, uh, we thought it was pretty decent to have saved 38% of the energy with a three-year payback using integrative design. Um, but then three years later, our team did a 70% saving, retrofitting a really tough half-century-old federal complex in Denver, facing the wrong way, everything wrong with it. And that made it more efficient than the most efficient new office in the United States, which in turn is only half as efficient as our own new office being built right now and requiring no heating or cooling equipment because we designed it out. And of course, that saves a lot of capital cost. Uh, so that's about an 85% reduction in energy intensity in five years, starting with a pretty decent design. So. This is not over yet. The low-hanging fruit keeps growing back faster than we can pick it. Uh, efficiency 
techniques and ways to finance and deliver them keep improving faster than we can install them, so the unbought megawatt reserve keeps getting ever bigger and cheaper, and indeed, this low-hanging fruit is mushing up around our ankles, spilling in over the tops of our waders, and you got a whole bunch of it in Pittsburgh. So lots to do on the supply side, let them all compete, but efficiency is a huge uh, largely untapped resource using modern technology, design, financing, marketing, and delivery, and I hope you all make a lot of money at it. Thank you. Henry, I, get, Henry, I was going to ask you one question. Just one question before you go. Yeah. Just, uh, just wanted one question on the integrative design question, because yeah. this is about when this gets local, you know, scaling to, to the local. And I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about when you think about places and where, you know, you talked about the Empire State Building and other kind of iconic uh, structures and so forth, but when you apply this kind of global thinking and, the, and the, this energy efficiency that we, is, we need to use, uh, how does that apply to places as you understand it? Well, every place is different and every place has different obstacles and opportunities. Of course, the whole trick is the obstacle uh, into opportunity alchemy, uh, as Ray Anderson said, turning stumbling blocks into stepping stones. Uh, but I think in a, in a city of this, with, with buildings of this vintage, uh, you should probably take a look at retrofitdepot, D-E-P-O-T dot org, which has a nice toolkit if you own a real estate portfolio for figuring out how to do the right things in the right order at the right time. Why do I say at the right time? Well, consider a 1970s curtain wall office building in Chicago, not too different a climate, hot and cold, and the glazing seals are failing in 1992. This was an actual case. Uh, that, that happens at that age. Every 20 years you need to reskin the curtain wall. And uh, rather than replacing with the awful glass that was there, we found if you put in even early 90s super windows, for an extra 78 cents for each square foot of glass, you could insulate four times, uh, actually eight times better. Uh, I think we didn't go quite that well. But you could also make it almost perfect in letting in light without heat. And if you combine that with deep daylighting, which you can retrofit all through the floor plate, and very efficient lights and office equipment, which you could do even better now, guess what? You need four times less peak cooling on a hot afternoon. Well, you have to do stuff to the, renovate the old mechanicals anyway because of agent CFCs, but now you can make that system not just four times more efficient, but also four times smaller, saving you 200,000 bucks, because you save more making it smaller than you pay to, more to make it efficient. And that's enough to pay for the extra cost of the windows, the daylighting retrofit, the lighting retrofit. Guess what? Minus five month payback. It's cheaper than the regular 20 year renovation you have to do anyway that saves nothing. Well, you're going to have, if you have a portfolio, it's going to take you decades to fix up the whole thing anyway, but if you synchronize that with what you're doing anyway, when you touch the building in some expensive way, maybe 5% of them a year, uh, you can get through them all and create enormously better real estate value, human performance, community value, and uh, we have a whole treatise on that about value beyond energy cost saving, showing gains in value and uh, productivity and health and so on that are worth uh, often one or two orders of magnitude more than the energy savings, which are really juicy. So right things in the right order at the right time, and you can make some really magical places. You can make buildings that create delight when entered, uh, health, happiness, and productivity when occupied, regret when departed. Great. Thank you. All right, health and happiness. All right, thank you very much. Thanks so much.